Hey everyone, today we're gonna do a showcase video on a facelift and specifically a jet lift. So you're feeling good now? Okay. Yeah. The uncensored footage for this video is actually on our Patreon, so go check that out. We have many other videos and we're putting out more of these showcases. We want to show you the footage, but YouTube makes it difficult for us to put out uncensored content. It flags it and it doesn't propagate the video. So patient background, this is a woman in her 50s. We don't want to reveal the exact age. People get sensitive about that. She wanted her jowls to be improved. She didn't like the amount of sagging that she saw in her neck. She wanted improvement there as well. So she had no prior facial surgeries. She did try Botox to the neck and she's had also some facial thread lifting with very limited efficacy. So we discussed the plan with her for a deep plane facelift and neck lift as long with the mid facelift and a platysmoplasty for the platysma muscle here. The incision designs were discussed with her in advance. We had planned to do incisions around the classic ones around the ear as well as under the chin to give us access to these areas. So there are different facelift approaches and you can check out our video about all the different styles of facelifting that are out there. And as I mentioned in that video, my preferred way to address the aging face is with a deep plane approach. Now it's not the right approach for everybody, but for the majority of patients, I feel that it's an appropriate way to do things. You're also able to capture the mid face that way and it addresses the global changes that are are occurring with time and your repositioning structures back to their kind of natural anatomic position. And also keep in mind that sometimes we have to add this submental approach. And actually with most of my facelifts, I'm adding this incision because it allows us access to the neck. And I like to kind of create a continuity between the neck compartment and then the facial compartments. It allows for better redraping of the skin. And it also gives us access to the subplatysmal space. So remember you have skin, then you have some fat, then you have the platysma muscle, and then you have other fat and, and other muscles deep to that. And sometimes the, that deep stuff gives you that extra fullness. So if you want to create a nice contour to the neck, you have to address that stuff that's underneath. For this particular patient, she really had very little going on in the deep compartment. So there wasn't much to do there, but I still went in and allowed for that redraping. And then as you'll see, the platysma was separated down the middle and we removed a very, very, very rarely do you have to remove a lot of platysma but then we put things back together. So make sure if you're not subscribed already to this channel, please subscribe. It helps the channel grow and this way you know about subsequent videos that we're putting out there. So thank you for that. So let's talk about the pre-op stuff. After midnight the night before, the patient wasn't able to eat or drink anything because we have to be safe with surgery. We did the photos, we did the consent, and then the marking process, right? So I'm gonna go over the different structures and the incision design you can watch in, in our facelift video, but what I wanna do is just to tell you about all the different things that you see here marked. So what you see here is that I've marked out the incisions right? The ones around the ear and respecting the temporal tuft of the hair, curving back and also the submental incision. And then in terms of other things that I like to mark, starting from like top down, we like to mark lateral aspect of the bone of the orbit. You're safe for about two centimeters going out lateral. There's no facial nerve that runs in that zone, about two centimeters. And then we draw the approximate trajectory of the temporal branch of the facial nerve, also important to have there. And and then you have this uh, line that we like to draw from the lateral campus of the eye all the way down to the angle of the mandible. And that's gonna be our deep plane entry point. That's where we go into the deep plane underneath the skin. You see an X mark here, that's marking the facial notch. And that's an important landmark of where the facial artery runs. It also tells us where the masseter muscle ends. And that's important um, as you'll see later on as well. And then the circle around it is telling me that the marginal branch of the facial nerve that controls the, the lower corner 
diameter of the lip is going to be somewhere running within that vicinity, within about a centimeter of that X. I also like to mark the lowest point of where I'm going when I'm undermining the skin and before the redrape, usually we go to the lowest crease or about the level of the cricoid cartilage. That's an important landmark. Then the sternocleidomastoid muscle, I like to mark the front edge of that. That also gives me information when I'm starting to work on the inside. Those are all the essential markings that are done. So we talked about the facial notch and its importance. Uh, the ideal location for the submental incision which is this incision down here, you want to mark it so that it's not too visible when you're looking from the frontal view. You want it hidden just underneath the chin and you also don't want it to stretch so far out to the sides where it's so visible when you're looking at someone from a profile view. But you want it large enough so you can actually work within that incision. And you also want to make sure that you preserve the sideburns, right? So that's the way we mark the incisions and the way I bevel my blade. I'm always thinking about the hair element of it because I'm a hair guy. So intro Operatively, patients um, get IV sedation. We protect the eyes, as you see us doing here. Tumescent anesthesia is what we use. This is diluted type of lidocaine, basically, and it's a combination of lidocaine and marcaine. It's basically just a combo type um, in a bag of saline. And we also put tranexamic acid in there, and that is a substance that's used to reduce bleeding during surgery, also reduces bruising after surgery. And we do about 50 five, zero, cc's of fluid in each area in the neck and then sides of the face. We have to control the hair because it likes to get everywhere. So I use actually autoclave tape and I wrap it around, do some staples. We prep the patient really well with betadine. We drape everything out sterilely. We do a timeout, of course, as before any surgery. And then I start with the submental approach first. I'm trying to I make my incision usually down to about the platysma muscle. And then I'm trying to raise a, a, a flap of skin. But I want to preserve some fat on the other side of it, right? So you don't want to go too deep, but you want to keep the flap kind of thicker because when you redrape that flap, if it's very thin, everything that you did on the undersurface can show. We're basically creating that flap by running the plane that's on top of the platysma muscle. And so that's our, our flap of skin. As we're doing that, we are also going to be releasing the mandibular ligament. And that's one of our facial ligaments that we're trying to release during these facelift surgeries. So we get to the first one early on in the surgery via this approach, submental, and we get to the mandibular ligament this way and this way, and then things move a bit better and it's better for redraping as well. So then we enter the platysma muscle. So don't do this for every patient, but in some patients I do, where we cut right down through the platysma and we get underneath the platysma and we raise some subplatysmal flaps. But sometimes it's because we're trying to address things on on the inside like we talked about deep below. Other times we're just trying to reduce tension there because then we're going to pull to the side and then we can tighten up the platysma down the middle, right? So you don't want to go in and just remove a lot of platysma down the center. That would be a mistake, but you want to redrape, then see what's left. So I get that exposure early on and then I come back to it later in the surgery. So again, let's just recap. We got four main ligaments that we're going through during a facelift. The first one is the mandibular. We get that early on during the submental approach. So this patient did not have any excess subplatysmal or super platysmal fat so we didn't have to worry about that and I left this area open until the end of the case and we control the bleeding with bipolar cautery sometimes monopolar as well just depends on the situation so now intraoperatively we then usually will start on the right side of the face and with the images that we show you guys we might switch back and forth just to see uh, sometimes depending on which side of the face we may have captured better footage of one portion of the of the specific procedural um, step compared to the other so you might see a switching from side to side but in general I start on the right side we then add the tumescence and we make our incisions we do the subcutaneous dissection so we're lifting skin and subcutaneous fat trying to keep that skin flap very uniform cross and it's all based on our initial markings right to mandibular line that line that you saw initially and we're staying deep once we're at that deep plane entry point then we need to enter that point but before we do that what I want to show you guys is there's 
there's this video in our collection here from this case where you can really see um, the greater auricular nerve and I wanted to just point that out to everyone. It's about textbook wise about six and a half centimeters below the external auditory canal is where you see it sort of crossing over greater auricular nerve and that's going to provide sensation to to the earlobe and to this sort of region here. So if you cut through that nerve people can get permanent uh, loss of sensation to that region and some people have had that problem um, with facelifts just in general. So I wanted to point out that nerve and to tell people it's not bad to like see a nerve you just want to make sure you protect it and don't cut through it. That's a sensory nerve that's not one of the motor nerves. So now we enter into the deep plane there are different ways to enter the deep plane. Some people will use a knife, some people will use a scissor, some people will use cautery. In this case we used cautery. One method isn't more right than another. There are pros and cons to each. With cautery you can tell if there is some firing activity, if the nerve is firing. Sometimes there could be some spread of electric signal so you don't exactly know but usually if you have it on a low enough setting it's a good clue to there being potentially a nerve around so telling you to kind of hey slow down. If you're using a knife or a scissor you don't get that same feedback until it's potentially too late but with the spread of the heat from cautery you could theoretically injure a nerve um, without cutting through it. So there are pros and cons and it's just surgeon specific. There's no one right way to do it. It just depends on, on, on where you're trained and, and what feels most comfortable in your hands. Now with the deep plane I like to start with my inferior pocket so I'm trying to find platysma muscle and get underneath the platysma muscle coming in from the side. So what's down is masseter muscle and what's up is the platysma muscle. Now I'm going through underneath the platysma muscle to the point of that X that I drew out in the beginning of the case, right? And because that's where the facial notch is, that's where the facial artery is. So that's usually my end point there. By the time you've gotten to that point, you've essentially lysed your masseteric ligament. So that's ligament number two, right? First one was mandibular, um, second one is the masseteric. And then we go to our superior pocket. The superior pocket lives at the area by the eye. I usually go above the orbicularis muscle. That's the muscle that wraps around the eye. And I'm usually going on the surface of that muscle. Some people go underneath that muscle, but either way, you can do either way. But you have to create a pocket there. And then you connect your two pockets and you try to get a nice deep plane flap going. And you'll be able to then move that flap around to reshift the face back to where you want it. So you connect those pockets. As you connect those pockets and you're going through, you're going to find yourself going through what's called the zygomatic ligament. And that's now going to be our third ligament, right? The zygomatic ligament. So you go through that and then once you have your mobilized deep tissue flap, then again you're able to maneuver it. The one final ligament is going to be your cervical retaining ligament. That's the connection of the platysma to the sternocleidomastoid muscle and that we usually separate three to five centimeters below the angle of the mandible is where we're going to kind of free up that platysma even more to again be able to redrape. So then I go ahead and I suture down the deep plane. I start at the jawline and I start to suture up. I use a running suture. Some people use interrupted sutures sutures. There are different ways again to do this. Some people use permanent suture. I prefer temporary dissolvable suture like Vicryl but again different different ways to do this. So once I'm done suturing then I will usually release the skin a little bit in this region here just as a one final step and then we're ready to place our drain. I prefer using drains overnight for facelifts. Some people don't use drains. That's fine but I, I like to use it just to know if we're having a, a significant buildup of bleeding or also to limit the risk of what's called a seroma which is um, the body building up some fluid. It's not going to prevent the hematoma but it can reduce the rate of seromas. So now it's important to tailor the skin because now we have this extra skin right? So we have to cut out the extra skin. We have to tailor it right? Just like someone who tailors suits we have to tailor the extra skin and cut, remove that and, and tailor it to the ear so everything looks nice. There's a lot of specific details with that specifically with how you recreate the tray because you want to thin out that extra skin you're bringing over but you don't want to shorten your skin so much that you get what's called a shotgun deformity. As the skin heals in this whole region can open up and give you a shotgun so you want to leave some enough skin on the tragus. So that's just one area and then there are tricks to reducing what's called a pixie ear deformity and again a lot
lot of it stems from just reducing tension on the closure. But yeah, lots of nuances there. We won't bore you with that. So then we repeat the same procedure on the opposite side of the face and we use a drain there as well. And then after all that, we return to the neck and we stop any bleeders. We close the platysma muscle, that deep muscle with again, some absorbable suture. And then we have to close the skin of the neck and we will play a video here uh, for you guys of the patient giving her um, immediate post-op uh, recollection of how she feels. So in the post-operative setting, um, it's very important to have very careful, close post-op observation. The biggest thing is that we are looking for any signs of a hematoma, and that's a collection of blood. That is something that can occur after a facelift, and we want to tend to that right away. Usually, patients will go home, and they'll have a nurse with them to take care of them overnight, and then that person will bring them back to the office the following morning, where I can check on them. We check on the dressings. We take everything down and the patient leaves uh, the office with like a whole wrapping with with drains and all we remove all of that the following morning we remove the drains and we're checking again for signs of hematoma this patient did quite well she didn't have any issues like that it's important to apply antibiotic ointment twice a day to the all the incision areas not to forget this one to protect the incisions from the sun to reduce your level of activity for the first two weeks I asked my patients to use a nice nightly wrapped only in the evenings, not throughout the day for the first week. We then had the patient return at one week for suture removal. She was very kind and was willing to record some videos at home about her general experience uh, recovering from surgery. So today is the first day that I can wear or not wear my compression hat. I can leave the scars open and we also have her results at one month um, that's about how far out she is right now she'll be coming back to for her three month visit and beyond as well and the scars take time to mature they are looking pretty good already but it takes about a year for the scars to fully mature and at least three months but usually more for all the swelling to go down as far as the jet lift procedure so it really in my practice is the deep plane facelift plus what we do in the post-operative setting that we feel really helps uh, improve the speed of just someone's recovery. I think it's important. A lot of times surgeons do surgery and then they don't want to think about anything else. They don't want to think about any pre-op stuff as far as like optimizing results or anything afterwards. It's just kind of like, let's just do the surgery. But it's important to think about all of that. So we consider the post-operative recovery period and we, we try to find ways to improve it. So the way we can do this is through lymphatic drainage massaging. This, I think the body plastics folks have been doing this for much longer than we have in facial plastics. I think. We we underestimate that type of stuff in facial plastics. I think we can do better. So um, one attempt towards that is this um, jet lift thing. So it's really utilizing the jet peel system, which is a wonderful system that uh, produces very high speed. Basically, it's a two-phase system, so there's liquid and air, but it's, it's very high speed, like uh, air, essentially, that you can mix in any kind of fluid. In this case, for lymphatic drainage, we do just like a hyaluronic type of fluid. Doesn't really matter what the actual fluid is, but it's that motion of that high speed jet hitting the skin and, and massaging massaging it and massaging it in the proper way where you're moving that swelling towards the drainage points of, of the lymphatic system. So you have to know where it is in the neck and move it towards that location. We do that at two weeks and at four weeks post-op, we don't target the incision lines themselves because that you know wouldn't be good for incision healing per se. So we avoid that, but everywhere else we're doing this massage and it's contactless. You don't have to touch the patient. You don't have to worry about moving things around. It's just a gentle lymphatic drainage with this jet peel system. So we offer that to all of our facelift patients and we find that they recover well and usually you know uh, relatively expeditiously so that's what i call the jet lift that was the facelift showcase i really hope that you enjoyed that if you enjoyed that video check out our surgical hairline advancement video which is different but i think also something you might find interesting click on the card i will see you there and 
please check out our first merch, which is a hoodie. And it's all about body positivity. We promote that on this channel in my practice. It's all about people just feeling good about themselves, whether it's through surgery or not. This is a hoodie to reflect just that. So take a look at it, see if you like it, get one for yourself, for your friends. And the link to that is in the description below. Thanks guys. See ya.